Hello, welcome to this webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much for attending this webinar today. Okay, so I think we should get started. We have quite a few people joining in. Thank you very much. My name is Alberto and I work for Cambridge Assessment English and I'm based in Brazil. But I work for Cambridge Assessment English in the Americas as well. This time, new year, new ideas, we are going to talk about how to teach an exam class for A2 key for schools and B1 preliminary for schools. So, uh, just to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about and before I ask you some questions, Today, we are going to talk about your teaching context, and then we're going to talk about setting SMART goals, how you can find out more about the exam, and then we'll talk about exam classes for A2, A1 key for schools and B1 preliminary for schools, and we're going to be sharing with you some ideas and activities for developing vocabulary and developing language skills. And also, we are going to give you a number of resources for you to start getting ready for your lessons, right? So talking about your teaching context, um, I'm based in Brazil, Latin America, in the Southern Hemisphere. So our classes are going to start next month in February. This is the beginning of our academic year. I have colleagues in the Northern Hemisphere and their classes have already started. They started in September, so they are in the middle of the academic year. So what, what's your situation now? Are you beginning your academic year or are you uh, in the middle of your academic year? And are you teaching face-to-face uh, -face classes or are you teaching remote classes? So please feel free to use the chat and share some of your thoughts. Okay, I can see some people are in the middle, teaching remotely, um, lots of people from lots of wonderful places, that's very nice, okay, teaching online. Well, I can see a few uh, teachers are teaching face-to-face, -face, which is nice. You know, we have come to a point where we miss teaching face-to-face -face classes because classes uh, will start over here, but remotely, okay, middle of the term, okay, very good. Fantastic, so we share similar realities over here. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. So one of the reasons why we are talking about um, key for schools, preliminary for schools, and how to prepare your learners for those exams is that when we're talking about learning a language, it's about setting goals but sometimes when we look at certain levels, for example, if you are at a beginner level and you want to get to level A2 or level B1, it might seem to your learner that they're going to be traveling through a long road, right? So when we set goals, it makes our lives easier as we start looking at those milestones along the way. And hopefully this will make uh, the journey more um, <clears throat> comfortable. This will make, uh, this will help our learners build their confidence because they will be achieving certain goals which can be based on their needs. Of course, this will be aligned with the curriculum as well. And it also gives teachers and learners a good time frame uh, to develop the skills students need to reach certain levels until they uh, come to the day when they'll be sitting the exams and they will be confident that they have developed the necessary skills for that level, right? So we are talking about here, uh, setting SMART goals. So what are SMART goals all about? So when we're talking about SMART goal, we are using SMART here as an acronym. This acronym has to do with goals that are relevant. So for example, what are my learning needs? If we are preparing the learners for a certain exam, what are their needs? Also, we are talking about goals that can be specific and time bound because we students will be sitting the exam by at some 
point in the future, like uh, by year X or by the end of the year, etc. And uh, it's important that we make goals specific. So what do I want my students to achieve this year, this term? If this, they're not sitting the exam this term, what is it that they need to achieve this term in order to be better prepared for the next term when they will be sitting the exam? Also, you can talk about uh, AIMS um, goals being specific for uh, individual classes. And also time bound, right? What do I want my students to achieve by a certain uh, time in the future? Also, we are talking about goals that are achievable. So is this level appropriate? And what support do I need to give my learners? In other words, is this also accessible when we uh, set goals and we set tasks to our learners? Are those tasks accessible for their level? And also uh, making goals measurable. So how will I know that the learners are making progress? How can I continue to assess them formatively so that they, are, uh, they have a sense of progress and that I as a teacher also have a sense of their progress? So setting SMART goals will be very important. One of the goals that we need to, to set is as teachers is of course to get to know the exam well. So we are talking about two exams here, A2 key for schools, B1 preliminary for schools. And here I have a question. When we're talking about um, knowing the exam well, what do teachers need to know about an exam they are preparing their learners for? Here, I have a question as a suggestion. For example, how long is the exam? Can you please use the chat and give some suggestions of things teachers need to know about the exam? And then I'll have a look at your chat and your comments and see uh, what is it that we need to know. Okay, somebody mentioned the format, okay? Validity, reliability, the types of activities, that's very important, excellent types of questions, specifications, very good. I can see that some people have typed the word assessment and my assumption is uh, that uh, teachers need to know how the items are assessed, what kind of criteria, uh, how many marks for each of that part of, of the exam. Okay, parts of the test, length, Excellent, lots of things. So <clears throat> this is a great brainstorming session. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some more ideas, which I'm sure you have already mentioned in the chat. So things like how long is the exam? Also, what skills are tested in the exam in the different parts of the exam? What sorts of questions and tasks are used to teach each skill? So we need to become familiarized and make the students familiar with the types of uh, questions and tasks. How many different parts are there? It's very important that they know that they will be sitting the exam for X hours divided in X parts. How much time is allowed for each part? And time is very important because this will tell how well prepared you are for that exam or for that paper that you have to perform within a certain time frame. What are the assessment criteria for each question type uh, or task type? This is extremely important because throughout the process, you need to give students feedback on a regular basis. And this has to be based on assessment criteria, right? How the exam is marked. This is important because students need to know if they are performing well, how many items they are getting right, if they are performing well in speaking and writing tasks based on which type of criteria, and how the results are presented as well. The students receive a statement of result and then they receive a certificate and their grades are aligned with the Common European Framework. They also receive a Cambridge English um, score. Um, in the Cambridge English scale. So they need to know, uh, we teachers need to be familiarized with this information and also inform the students about all those features in the, in the way the results are presented. So <clears throat> we have here 
a very good set of questions that we can use at the beginning of the term, or if you are in the middle of the term and the students will be sitting the exam a year later or at the end of the term, you can use those questions as some sort of uh, um, uh, treasure hunt, or you can do some kind of quest where students can look at a sample paper and then by looking at those questions, they can find out more or revise information about the exam they will be sitting so that both teachers and learners are well familiarized with, the, with all those features about the exams. By all means, this is not a complete list, right? This is just some, some points as a result of a brainstorming activity. I'm sure you have considered other points over there as well. We talked about uh, how many parts or which skills are tested in an exam. So it's very important that we start preparing learners <clears throat> for those skills, but knowing exactly what they will be tested on and assessed on. So um, we are going to divide this session according to skills. We're going to start with reading skills. And one of the things that we need to bear in mind when we are preparing learners for an exam is that on the day of the exam, when the learners see those items on the question paper, those items are there to assess their performance. In the classroom, prior to the exam, we are going to be using very similar items. But in the classroom, of course, we need to assess their performance. But before that, before we come to that point, we need to help students build those skills. So one thing is those items on the day of the exam, when they will be assessed in the classroom, those items can be used as a means to develop skills to help students reach certain levels and develop uh, exam strategies and specific skills for the level, right? So the reading paper for key for schools and preliminary for schools, they are fairly different. We are talking there about two different levels. So level A2, level B1, the reading paper for key for schools is combined with the writing paper. Uh, so we have items for reading, items for writing, which form one single paper, reading and writing. Reading has to do with parts one to five. Preliminary for schools, on the other hand, has a individual reading paper separate from writing. And this, uh, this is new, it started last year, by the way, <clears throat> right? So you have one hour for key for schools, 45 minutes for preliminary for schools, but one hour in key for schools is for both reading and writing. So we need to help learners at level A2 to manage their time well for this paper, okay? <clears throat> one of the things that you will find both in key for schools and preliminary for schools for part one in the reading paper is a number of signs that uh, students need to interpret. So these are some of the examples of signs that you will see <clears throat> in the key for schools exam. Those come from the sample paper that is available on the website. We are going to talk about this. One of the things that we need to help students to understand is how to interpret those signs. So uh, getting students to uh, become better uh, aware of what those things are, where they might see them, and who the reader of the messages, uh, of those messages would be is very important because signs, they bring very little text, but they convey, uh, they can convey a lot of information, right? So for example, we have here one of the signs from the test that we can work in the classroom. Students can look at the sign as a suggestion and they can start making inferences about this with the help of the teacher. Where can you see this sign? And then also together with the sign, they have the exam item with the options. So this is a moment for the teacher to help students to understand um, uh, the content in the sign. So asking uh, questions such as, 
Uh, is a woman a child? How are they different? The purpose here at level A2 is to get students to explain, to describe, and then start using all those communication skills, which will be important for the speaking paper as well. And then you can start clarifying things or drawing students' attention to things in the sign, like what does uh, needs new tires mean? Or do we know how big Deb Debbie is? So these are things students can infer from the sign with the help of the teacher. And then things like, do we know why Debbie is selling the bike, et cetera? And um, the answers may be uh, right or wrong. They, they can just be inferences where they don't have a correct answer. And then learners will be better able to look at the items here, for example, uh, the, the sign and the options, the multiple choice options they have, and they can start answering this together with the teacher working in pairs and groups, etc. Then the teacher gives feedback and you can continue uh, doing this with the other signs that they have in the test, right? This is true for A2 for P4 schools, B1 preliminary for, for schools, B1 also has a similar uh, type of item. Here is a bigger version of this uh, part one of the reading paper uh, in the preliminary for schools. So you can use similar strategies. You will notice, however, that preliminary for schools, because it's at a higher level, you may have a bit more information in each of the signs, right? Those techniques, they can also be useful for uh, part two of the reading paper in preliminary for schools where learners have to match profiles with uh, types of activities or types of courses for the different uh, profiles here. So they need to be able to infer, to read, infer information quickly, and then um, try to do the match. And you can see here that we have five profiles and eight types of uh, courses in that case. So which course matches which profile? So by helping the students to infer for part one, we'll also help them with uh, techniques, reading techniques for part two, which they have to be able to do more quickly at level B1, right? <clears throat> Another thing about reading is in the classroom, making sure that uh, we uh, set topics before learners uh, go to, to the text, right? So this is one option. I'm sure many of us uh, teachers use pictures to uh, elicit information or to set a topic before we give students a listening uh, activity or a reading activity. So for example, making use of pictures with questions for which you have, uh, for which you don't have right or wrong answers is very important because it generates conversation. So here is um, a collection of images uh, from uh, one website, Unsplash. And students can look at this uh, collection of images to answer some questions. For example, what do they all have in common? Again, there is no correct answer to this question. Which could be the odd one out and why? What do you think is missing from the selection of pictures? So getting students to, again, start explaining, describing, um, maybe uh, agreeing, disagreeing at level A2, uh, using some expressions in order to get the students to express their, their thoughts. And then you can continue uh, by saying that those pictures uh, describe a uh, situation. We are talking about school here, uh, for example. And then you can start giving students um, uh, ideas of strategies for uh, reading, uh, a reading activity, for example, skimming. So here is one idea for you. You can uh, use some of those points here with your learners. So when skimming, I need to Students have to read those sentences and say whether they are right or wrong for scheming. One of the things that you can do, because we're talking about level A2, is to uh, use those awareness raising activities 
in local language if you think this will be more appropriate for your learners, right? Because here we are talking about helping them to develop certain reading skills, in this case, skimming. So they have to say, I need to understand everything. Is this right? Is this wrong? Is that about skimming? Um, get a general understanding of the text. Is this right? Is this wrong? So here is one idea for you. So we also have question five, which is kind of open-ended, things like, I skim text in my first language when, again, this is very important because we're helping st the students to apply skills that they already have in their language and use those skills in the uh, English language uh, for reading uh, activities, right? So it's a very interesting thing to do. And then once you have gone through some of the exam strategies and sub skills, you can show the students the text and then you can set them like two general questions for them to start skimming the text. And then after you uh, elicit the answer doing pair work or if you are teaching remotely, if your platform allows using breakout rooms, you can, for example, um, get the students to discuss the answers uh, in their groups. And by uh, helping the students, uh, chances are that in 40 seconds, look, by looking at the title and scheme reading, they will have a good understanding of the text, like who wrote it, topic areas, how the text is organized, and, and um, where certain information is. So this will help better prepare them for the exam task and then this is a moment for you to present the items and get the students to scheme and then scan in order to answer the questions. This, is, this task is very similar uh, to uh, task, uh, the task part three in uh, preliminary for, for schools. So we have um, part three key for schools with three option multiple choice items. And part three, preliminary for schools, four option multiple choice items, right? So you can um, use similar techniques for level A2 and B1. And then you can decide if you're using it with A2, you can do the awareness raising activities in local language or in English, right? Now we're going to talk about uh, writing skills, which um, is one of the things I, really love working with. I like preparing learners for all the skills, but writing is somehow very close to, to my heart. So looking at the structure of those papers, as we have seen uh, when we are talking about reading, in key for schools, reading and writing is part of one paper so that they, they are combined. Writing has to do with parts six and seven. So in one hour in key for schools, they have to be able to do reading and writing. Whereas in preliminary for schools, and this is, as I said, fairly new, it only started last year, writing has become a separate paper from reading. So they have 45 minutes in which to write two texts with about 100 words each text. So the level of challenge when you compare A2 and B1 is um, quite high, right? So it's important to prepare learners well for those skills. So speaking of writing, um, here is an idea, then I'll tell you where many of those ideas have come from. I'm sure you will enjoy it um, because we have lesson plans available for you with many of those ideas here. So here is a text that, uh, you can use in the classroom with your learners. And here is a, uh, a task for you. Please use the chat to answer some of those questions. For example, what type of text is this? What is the intended audience? Is this one person? Is this more than one person? Is this um, schoolmate? Um, who's the intended audience for this text? How about the level of the text? Is that levels A2 or B1? Why? Can you mention any features that will justify your option 
And can you suggest one or two ways of scaffolding writing if you are using this text with your learners? So let's look at the chat and see some of your comments here. So some of you are saying level uh, B1, okay. You have also mentioned part one, probably for preliminary for schools. Okay, there's plenty of abbreviations. Okay, uh, we have some features there mentioned. Okay, a type of text, probably an email. Some people are saying level um, A2, B1, okay. More than one person I can see, that's the intended uh, audience, fantastic. There is simple grammar structure. Okay, some people are saying this is an email, this is a letter. Okay, and the audience is more than one person, okay? Yes, okay, it can be used for both level A2, B1, some people are saying. Fantastic, uh, this is a great contribution, everyone. Thank you very much for your ideas. In fact, we can see here that we have uh, an email, uh, probably because we have the word subject there, which reminds us of the email template. The intended audience is actually more than one uh, person uh, because they are asking ideas from uh, a, a group of people. Well, level of the text, it can be used as an input text, that is a reading material for your class, either with level A2 or B1, and then you can grade the level of the task so that you can better address the specific audience you have. Features, we have lots of abbreviations, okay? And what about ways of scaffolding the text uh, to students? Okay digital language, informal language, okay, any ways that you can kind of suggest um, uh, so that you can better help the students uh, with this text. Okay, it is informal, very good. All right, so let's look at some ways. If we are using this text with A2 level students, so students preparing for an A2 level exam, we can, for example, give them the text. We can also give them a very uh, simple form for students to read and then complete by extracting information from the text. Right, so they read the, the email and they complete the form about Ben. If we are Working with <clears throat> higher level students or even with A2 level students, that would depend on your focus. <coughs> Sorry. You can work with the acronyms and abbreviations in the text. So you can draw students' attention to some of those acronyms and abbreviations over here. You can also turn this abbreviations activity into a task, for example, students have to, uh, to match. Uh, you can kind of uh, uh, shuffle the, the options here, uh, scramble the options so that students can do the matching and work with the meaning of the acronyms and abbreviations. And this, uh, you can also use that text, Ben's birthday, to kind of look at the questions that are asked and turn that into an exam task very similar to part one for preliminary for schools where you have a text and then you have to react to this text by answering some questions or by showing uh, agreement with an idea. And here is an example where you can see the text, the input text for preliminary for schools. You also have some notes that you have to include in your answer to this text, right? And you can also, as a means of uh, preparing students for this task in the classroom, you can, for example, look at the um, highlighted areas of the text where you can see those notes. 
you have the note prompt and students, before you give them the task, students can start listing what they would say in reply to those points in the text. And here is an example for you. And by the way, this activity here with this beautiful grid uh, is available uh, from our lesson plans for preliminary four schools, right? So you have a whole lesson there with hand printable handouts that you can use with your classes remotely or face-to-face. -face. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll tell you where you can find the lesson plans by the end of the session. So this is one idea to help students build the skills, organize information, and once they complete the grid, they can go and uh, write their answers um, to uh, Mrs. Lake. Here, I don't have, I say, a text, but I have a task. So here we have a task. You are going to Ben's birthday party on Friday, so write an email to Ben's mom to ask X, Y, Z, as you can see here. And you have to write an answer uh, using around 25 words. So this is key for schools part six. Again, we have what kind of text does the task ask the learners to uh, write? Is that a letter, etc.? What is the intended audience? That changes now because in the other task, the intended audience was a group of people. Now the intended audience is one person. <clears throat> so you're going to write to Ben's uh, mom. Level of the text, A2, we have some features that we need to include. And we need to help learners to uh, scaffold their uh, writing before they are ready to uh, immediately start uh, writing the message, right? So uh, using the, this text, you can, for example, get the students to look at the points required and they have to agree on some of the uh, answers before they put it down to paper, let's say. So they agree together the best time, uh, you no know, good idea to start a party, the best time. Also, they can decide on what they want to bring, if anything, and they can discuss ideas of presents to Ben. And then once they have agreed on those points, this generates conversation, developing speaking skills, they, uh, they then uh, write their note with the answers they uh, discuss together. So this is one way. Also in terms of writing, it's uh, all very important to, again, awareness raising activities, help the students to reflect on the task before, after. So before they write, ask students to read the task and make sure they know what they have to do how they will read the text or who will read their text, the intended audience, whether it's going to be formal, informal, that will impact on the language, how many words they need to write, and what points they need to include. So we are talking here about points they need to include, both for levels A2 and B1. And once they have submitted a first version find out uh, from, get the learners to think about it and find out if they have written enough, if they had managed their time, if they managed to conclude it within the allotted time that you set, if they checked their work, if they found it difficult and how they could improve uh, specific points of the text for next time and if possible, give the students the chance to submit a second draft. And this is very close to writing as it is in real life, isn't it? We draft and then we redraft, etc. cetera. Um, you may have heard about this before because we announced this um, uh, a lot last year, many opportunities. We have new teacher guides for the assessment of writing available from our website. They are brand new guides and they are designed to help you teach and assess learners writing in preparation for their, for their exams. Not just assessing, but also teaching learners how to write and 
how we can better assess their writing prior to the exam. So these are available for you, absolutely free of charge. And they have great ideas. For example, one of the activities that you have to do for part two in key for schools is to write a story based on prompts. So this is a task which involves uh, creative thinking and imagination. And in the classroom, we have to make sure we provide learners with a safe space to write uh, where they are not worried about mistakes. So all those things that we do prior to setting the writing task so that learners can discuss, can check, can uh, peer assess, and then uh, feel that they are in a space where if they make a mistake, this will only mean a step for development, right? So uh, they think about this type of task uh, with, your, with your learners, and then you can think about the steps to generate ideas and create this safe space to write. So one of the suggestions for this task is to work with images. Uh, for time's sake, we are not going to be working with those images here, but just to give you an idea, students, uh, you can get images from the internet to elicit ideas from learners, and then the learners can look at those three images and create a story. So very briefly, do you think uh, by looking at those three images, what the story will be? So I'll just look at the chat and see some of your ideas. What do you think the story would be about? Okay, I can see uh, some comments related to the ideas. Excellent. Okay, it could be about rescuing a cat, saving a cat. So the cat that gets stuck uh, in a tree. Yes, so once learners uh, have decided on the idea of the story, then they go and they start drafting the story, this time practicing the language for this, which is using some connectors to kind of sequence the events of the story, what happened first, what happened last. And by doing so, uh, you will be mirroring the exam task for um, uh, key for schools where they have to write a story based on visual prompts, right? And this is an example from uh, the sample uh, test from the website. So you will be giving the learners opportunities to, to practice speaking for fluency, activating ideas and language, creating safe spaces to write, and writing in response to picture prompts, and better preparing them for this task at level A2. Level A2, they need a lot more support and by using images and creating a safe space, this will be more engaging for learners, right? We're also talking about developing listening skills, listening as well as reading. Um, very important that we take those two skills into consideration because each learner has to have the opportunity to process information by themselves, right? Uh, somebody can write a letter for you, but somebody cannot really uh, give you the processes that our brain uses when we are listening and reading. So each learner has to do it by themselves. Of course, we set pair work and group work activities, but it's important that learners process information so they develop the necessary listening and reading skills for the exam, right? So listening, key for schools, uh, 30 minutes, a separate paper, preliminary for schools, 30 minutes with some time to transfer the answers, again, another separate paper. So they have a uh, similar uh, length, but uh, they have the same amount of, par of questions, but different parts. So when we're talking about uh, listening, here is an example of Key for Schools Part 3. There are five uh, parts to Key for Schools listening. We are going to focus on some of them. I'm focusing on the ones that are similar in Key for Schools and Preliminary for Schools, like Part 3, for example, where you have a dialogue and then um, you have a number of options 
all this one single audio, right? So how can we help the learners develop uh, those skills for the exam? We can ask students to read the questions, for example, and underline keywords uh, in the questions. So this is item 14 here. And uh, they, use, they underline the most important information in the question and in the answers, right? And then we need to tell learners, we need to make them aware that uh, they might hear more than one of the keywords in the audio. So they will probably hear things like makes her laugh because it's a true story, but only one of them will be the correct answer. So they need to be trained to listen and to distinguish information so they can uh, better answer the questions, right? So the other thing is learners uh, might not hear the keywords in the answers at all. So in order to prepare for this, one suggestion here is get learners to think about other ways to say the answers. For example, makes her laugh. It's funny, a true story, it really happened. Because the answer might be a true story, but the, uh, the audio, the person in the audio didn't actually say a true story. So they need to be able to listen to those things and interpret information. So getting the students to say things in different ways will be uh, important to help them become more sensitive to those features of the task, right? So they can think of other ways to say the answers in each of the questions. And then when you play the audio, you can uh, check the answers or give the students to pair check. And then you can play the audio again. In the classroom, you can play the audio again and again, or you can just play bits of the audio for a specific exam item. It's not an issue in the classroom. It's not the day of the exam. You can play and play again or play parts of it to get the learners to practice and develop their listening skills, right? As I said, uh, part three for K4 schools and part four for preliminary four schools, they are very similar, ex uh, except that the number of questions are different. We have six questions for preliminary four schools. It's a higher level, but what they have in common is that uh, you have one dialogue and you have a number of uh, items. Those skills um, that I mentioned are also valid for parts one, parts two, where learners have, for example, to uh, listen to uh, individual audios for each of the items. So they need to be able to check the answers, say things in different ways, think about options, and then interpret information to provide the correct answer, right? So for listening, the recommendation is practice and practice. Once you have done the tasks with the learners, you can use the transcript of the recording. And then they can use the transcript to identify key phrases, cues, uh, distraction, etc. There are parts of um, speech. So uh, it's part of natural speech. So all the pauses, things like connected speech, right? So we are also talking about drawing students' attention to features of pronunciation, how something was stressed in the audio because there was a purpose to stress that bit of information, intonation, etc. if they are asking questions or reacting to something, and practice different types of listening to develop your learner's listening skills. So what we are saying here is that testing should not be the only focus, right? But developing all those skills will be very important. Last but not least, speaking skills. Um, so those exams, they have a separate speaking paper. As we can see here, we have two parts for key for schools, four parts for preliminary four schools. And one thing we need to remember is that last year, key for schools, uh, from last year on, key for schools um, started uh, with this new format 
of part two of the speaking paper, right? So we are going to look at it now. One of the things that we need to consider for both key and preliminary for schools is practice with questions. So here is one activity for, for learners. For example, you can break quest, uh, questions into uh, parts, two parts, and you can get the learners uh, to do the right matching, the beginning of the question with the continuation of the question. So once you have the, the right answers from the learners, you can use those questions to establish this, um, uh, to start the conversation and establish this rapport with learners. And these are some of the uh, topics that will uh, appear in the speaking paper of those exams, right? So one of the things we need to help learners develop is the ability to stretch communication, to add information to what they are answering. So, for example, when you look at a question such as, what subject do you like best? The answer is history. Well, is this a good answer? Is this true that in natural communication, we answer questions like this with one word and then the conversation stops? So we can help learners develop um, this awareness that they can give better responses to those questions. So for example, what subject do you like best? One idea could be using language that they are uh, familiarized with. I really like history because I enjoy learning about the past. Again, defining, describing, explaining, especially for A2 level, those three key verbs are very important defining, describing, explaining, so they can produce more language and make communication more natural. So helping them to stretch uh, communication by uh, doing those three things, right? Then you can, for example, uh, help learners with good advice. So here is a list of uh, pieces of advice for learners in preparing for speaking. So you can get the learners to tick the good advice. Again, depending on the context, because this is an awareness raising activity, you might wish to do this in local language. So it's up to you really. And um, once you go through this, here, is, um, here are the answers to, to the bits of advice. Uh, again, you can find this activity in the set of lesson plans that are available to you. Uh, you can get the learners to think about how to communicate better, et cetera. It's very important to do awareness raising activities with um, exam practice um, activities as well. So in preparing for speaking, it's very important to uh, show uh, features of the exam to learners. So when we compare the speaking uh, papers of key and preliminary, we see that they have similarities. For part two, key for schools, and part three, preliminary for schools, it's similar in the sense that they have a discussion task with visual stimulus. Key for schools, they, they should aim to talk about all the activities, not focus on one or two. So they need to look at all the uh, prompts. Same for uh, preliminary for schools. So they look at all the prompts that they shouldn't try to come to a conclusion too quickly because they need to show their full range of language ability. Again, part two, candidates are encouraged to extend as much as possible. So they need to give opinions. Um, define, describe, explain, et cetera, ask questions. And here for preliminary for schools, they need to respond to each other's ideas. So to make the communication even more natural and move the discussion forward, uh, giving opinions, asking questions, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is an example of the new part two for key for schools um, ever since 2020. So. This is what they have to do, talk about different hobbies, very different from the old part two. And then we have 
um, the ordinary part three for preliminary four schools where they need to discuss the prompts and come to a conclusion together. And then you can go back to awareness raising activities by asking students questions such as, when you have a conversation with your friend, does one person keep talking and the other just listen? This is very important to help the learners not to dominate on the day of the exam when they are doing those tasks, right? How can you involve your friend? You can ask questions. Okay, what should you do when your friend is talking? You should listen. What can you do to show you are listening? You can nod your head. Uh, you can uh, say uh, things like, great, yes, I agree, etc." giving the students the skills to make the communication more uh, natural. Going back to part two for key four schools, we have um, one example of idea. Um, we have the, the pictures. We can use a table like this with the activities. And before students start talking, you can get students to uh, react to those images if they like, if they hate, if they can't play, what they think about those activities, too difficult, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is one idea, right? Going back to setting SMART goals, we have different papers with lots of different parts for the exams. We have to make sure that our goals are SMART, so they have to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. So I had to do that for the purposes of this uh, session. And here uh, on the website, we have an area where we have blog posts. One of the blogs is about exam preparation tips to help uh, build student confidence. You have some ideas of um, uh, activities uh, or templates to help learners set SMART goals. Here we have two different options and you can use one of those options with your learner, or you can prepare your own. Uh, this is very simple, so that learners can start uh, setting goals in terms of what they feel they need more support uh, with from you, from the activities, and then what they need to work on at home, for example. So those templates will be very useful, right? We have a number of resources to share with you. Uh, we have sample tests that you can download from our website for both exams. Each of those exams will have um, word lists and we have a number of things that we can do with the word list. For example, we have those posters for the different exams to practice the word list and those sets of posters, they come with those brand new teaching activity booklets for each set of posters for you to practice the language in the vocabulary lists for key and preliminary for schools. Excellent resources. You can also find out more about the expectations uh, in terms of skills for each of the exams by looking at the can do summaries, which are available on the handbooks for teachers, which you can also download from our website in the preparation area. We have an area of the website where you can download lesson plans with those ideas that I showed uh, to you, complete lesson plans with guidelines, printable handouts and everything. And you can download uh, sets of lesson plans, whether you're teaching face-to-face -face or remotely for each of the levels and each of the exams. So here are some examples of the lesson plans that you can download. We also have platforms for you to practice speaking uh, and writing. We have Speak and Improve. We have Write and Improve where you can develop skills can be done for self-study. So practice with your learners. We have our Cambridge English TV on YouTube with lots of videos. This webinar will be available there as well. We have our exam preparation page where you can download all those resources that I mentioned, information, lists, games and social media, 
uh, official Cambridge English preparation materials, sample tests. We have the new teacher's guide for writing, as I mentioned before. And I think we have some time for questions, right? Let me go to the uh, chat and the Q&A and see the questions that you might have over here. So, Natasha, any questions uh, you would like to ask or should I go to the chat straight away? Yes, there are some questions in the Q&A. Let me just go back up to the top. Um, okay. So someone is asking, could they please know the exact difference between assessment, testing and evaluation? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a very good question. Um, and this is one of the questions I like uh, talking about, by the way. Well, uh, it's important to see which is inserted in which area, right? So, for example, let's start from the assessment area. Assessment uh, involves a number of processes. One of the things you can do to assess learners is to give them a test, right? So a test is a type of assessment, but it's not the only way to assess students. You can assess students in different ways. In the classroom, for example, when you give them a speaking activity in pairs, you can assess students while you monitor the activity, or when you give them an exercise online or uh, in the classroom on a handout, and you, can, you want to check how confident students are in using a specific structure, or understanding a specific text. So these are also ways of assessing learners, but it's not necessarily using a test. Evaluation, on the other hand, is something that uh, you can do as a teacher, as a coordinator. You can, for example, evaluate the quality of the tests you are giving to your learners. You can evaluate the quality of the assessment processes or activities that you are using to assess learners in the classroom. You can evaluate the quality of teaching, for example, and you can also ask students to evaluate the kind of teaching they are getting from your institution or from you as a teacher by asking the students um, uh, how well they are learning, whether the activities are helping them to develop uh, the skills are to meet their expectations, so students would be evaluating you and your classes in that case. So evaluation is different from assessment. Assessment is what teachers do to learners, and evaluation teachers can evaluate uh, what they are doing, the test they are setting, they can also evaluate the quality of the materials, for example. Thank you, Natasha. Perfect. I think that's all the time we have for questions um, today, I'm afraid. Um, but thank you, Alberto, for a very informative presentation. OK, I would just like to uh, finish by showing some key references. Only two very important bits of information about this is the new English classroom section of the Cambridge website. When you go to the website, cambridgeenglish.org, go to your new English classroom, where you find all the um, information and all those different sections for you to download the lesson plans and the activities and the writing guides, etc. And the blog area of the website, where you can see a short blog post on exam preparation tips to help build student confidence, right, for the exam. I would like to thank you very much for attending this presentation. Thank you, Natasha, for uh, your support and the marketing team. And have a good day or afternoon or rest of the evening, wherever you are, everyone. Thank you very much.